Mr. Rottenborn? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Rutmore, is your mic on? I, I just believe can't. it is. Oh, there we go. Okay. Does that work? Okay. In trying to convince you that Mr. Depp has carried his burden of proof in proving that he was never abusive to Amber on even one occasion, think about the message that Mr. Depp and his attorneys are sending to Amber and by extension to every victim of domestic abuse everywhere. If you didn't take pictures, it didn't happen. If you did take pictures, they're fake. If you didn't tell your friends, you're lying. And if you did tell your friends, they're part of the hoax. If you didn't seek medical treatment, you weren't injured. If you did seek medical treatment, you're crazy. If you do everything that you can to help your spouse, the person that you love, rid himself of the crushing drug and alcohol abuse that spins him into an abusive, rage-filled monster, you're a nag. And if you finally decide that enough is enough, you've had enough of the fear, enough of the pain, and you have to leave to save yourself, you're a gold digger. That is the message that Mr. Death is asking you to send. But he doesn't stop there, because in Mr. Death's world, you don't leave Mr. Death. And if you do, he will start a campaign of global humiliation against you. A smear campaign that lasts to this very day. He will do everything he can to destroy your life, to destroy your career. That is what they're saying, ladies and gentlemen. And that's what they're trying to get you, the jury, to be an accomplice to. But it's not surprising, because Mr. Depp cannot and will not take responsibility for his own actions. It's always someone else's fault. Just as Ms. Vasquez did and Mr. Chu did, I would like to extend my thanks to you on behalf of Amber and our whole legal team for the care and the diligence with which you have served as jurors in this matter. You've paid attention to every witness, every piece of evidence, and I can't even imagine the sacrifice that you've made in terms of time away from your friends, your family, your job, to be here on this jury. It's a very important role that you're serving, and we thank you very much. Let's pick up where we started six weeks ago in opening statement. You may remember that I asked you to keep a simple question in mind, which is, why are you here? And much of what you've heard during the course of this trial you don't need to make a decision on in order to return a verdict for Ms. Heard on Mr. Depp's claim of defamation. Now, we'll talk about Ms. Heard's claim of defamation against Mr. Depp, and Elaine will address most of that in a few minutes. But your key question to answer is, does the First Amendment give Ms. Heard the right to write the words that she wrote in this article on December 18th, 2018. That's the question. And you cannot simultaneously protect and uphold the First Amendment and find in favor of Johnny Depp on his claim. You simply cannot. You have to decide, should someone be able to write an article like that in the United States of America without being sued successfully, without having to go through the hell that Ms. Heard has gone through? So let's talk about that. And to do that, we get to explain a bit more about the law that you have to follow. This is the op-ed piece. I'm not going to read it to you again. You heard me read it to you in opening statements. And I would urge you, when you're in the deliberation room, read it. Read it again. And I know we focus on it you know, here and there over the course of the trial, but the vast majority of this trial has not focused on these words, on this piece. This is obviously the paper edition. There's the online edition as well. Now we get a chance to discuss with you exactly what you have to find about this article. Let's try this again. 
This is one of the jury instructions that you'll, you'll get. And I've been so looking forward to being able to actually explain to you, as, as the judge read all the instructions to you this morning, and I know it was a lot, but we've been looking forward to being able to explain to you what you're here to decide. Because I imagine for some of the case, it's been kind of unclear. What are you being asked to decide? These are the things that you have to find, and you have to answer yes. As Mr. Chu said, you have to answer yes to all of them in order to find in favor of Mr. Depp. So you have to find that the statement was about Mr. Depp. And you can decide that in the context of the article. And I'll get to the arguments that Mr. Depp raises on that in a minute. You also have to find that the statement is false. And we're gonna look at the statements here. We're gonna look at each of the three statements. And in order to win his claim, Mr. Depp has to prove every single element. And, and there's a concept in the jury instructions that you really didn't hear from Mr. Depp's side this morning, but you've all heard it, I'm sure, outside the courtroom, which is burden of proof. It is Mr. Depp's burden to prove each and every one of these elements. If he cannot, Ms. Heard wins. If he cannot prove each and every one of these elements under the burden of proof that's applicable, Ms. Heard wins. And there's two different burdens of proof that we'll get to. For all of them except number seven, the burden of proof is greater weight of the evidence. So you weigh the evidence and you decide, has Mr. Depp proven to you the first six elements? The seventh one for actual malice, the clear and convincing evidence standard, we'll get to in a few minutes. But these are, this is what he has to prove. And he cannot do that. These are the three statements. And I know you may be thinking to yourself, wait a second, don't we have to decide if Mr. Depp committed abuse? And the answer is no, you don't have to, because these three statements, you can decide as a matter of law, or as, as a matter of fact, as you weigh the evidence and the facts, that they're true. So the first two statements I'm gonna to address together. Then, two years ago, I became a public figure representing domestic abuse, and I felt the full force of our culture's wrath for women who speak out. Number two, I had the rare vantage point of seeing in real time how institutions protect men accused of abuse. When you go back to the jury room to deliberate, you should feel free, like I said, to read the article and think of the article's purpose. The jury instructions also tell you to take these statements in the context of the article. Think about the purpose. The purpose of the article was to promote legislative measures designed to protect victims of domestic abuse designed to protect people who did exactly what Ms. Heard did, to speak out. That's apparent on the face of the article. And to do that, Ms. Heard talked about her own life experiences as someone who had obtained a TRO against Mr. Depp, someone who had accused Mr. Depp of domestic violence. Make no mistake, and, and they, they, Mr. Depp's side keeps trying to say that we're somehow suggesting that two years before she wrote this, that Ms. Heard hadn't had anything to do with Mr. Depp. We're not saying that. You heard it. Miss Heard herself say, of course, two years before I wrote this article, I felt the full force, the force of our culture's wrath for women who speak out after she obtained a temporary restraining order against Mr. Depp, after she became a public figure representing domestic abuse. But the words that she wrote here, and then chronicling her own experience after that, those words are true. Those words are true. Similarly, the rare vantage point of seeing based on her own experiences post May 27th, 2016, how institutions protect men accused of abuse, those words are true and the First Amendment protects Ms. Heard's right to say them. Now the third statement is absolutely true as well, but we're gonna take that separately because she didn't write it. Under the First Amendment, the statements have to be false in order for Mr. Depp to win. Now, plaintiff addresses, like I said, an argument that we're not making. And as I said, we're not running from the fact that when she discussed becoming a public figure representing domestic abuse, Amber was speaking of her experiences reporting domestic abuse against Johnny Depp. She admitted to that, but that doesn't make the article or the statements about Johnny Depp. Think about it. Think about every piece of evidence that you've heard over the last six weeks about his abuse, about their relationship. None of that is in the article. None of it. We all know that it would be a very different article if she had written about what she suffered, that she's told you about over the last six weeks. Because he knows the words are true, 
Mr. Depp says that the words now have a defamatory implication. He says the statements are the same as saying, Johnny Depp abused me. But just because he wants to make the article about himself doesn't mean it is. He has to show you that any defamatory implication was designed and intended. Look at number four, designed and intended by Ms. Heard to convey the defamatory meaning that he suggests. Just because people might read the article and remember, oh yeah, Amber Heard used to be married to Johnny Depp and she accused him of abuse. That doesn't mean that she designed and intended defamatory implications in writing about herself. And think about it, if Mr. Depp is right, then virtually any statement that anyone could ever make about their own life that implies anything, implies any involvement with any other person could be defamatory. And that's clearly not what the First Amendment intends. She didn't design and intend the words to be the equivalent of writing Johnny Depp abused me. And you don't have to take her words for it. You can take the words of Terrence Doherty of the ACLU. He said that the op-ed wasn't even Ms. Heard's idea. The ACLU wrote the first draft, and great care was taking, taken in drafting the article so as not to make it about Mr. Depp or Ms. Heard's relationship with him. That's the only evidence presented about Ms. Heard's motive, except her, her, her statements that that was exactly what she wanted to do. She wanted to talk about her experiences after Johnny Depp. She wanted to own her story after Johnny Depp and fit those into what other women experience, what other people experience, having accused someone of domestic abuse and the backlash that they suffer, and then talk about legislative measure, measures that could help protect people in those positions. That's what she meant, and that's what the article is about. There's no hidden meaning here, ladies and gentlemen. This isn't a hit piece on Johnny Depp. This isn't a hit piece on Johnny Depp. And you can end here. You can end there by saying the statements that she wrote were not false and the First Amendment protects them. Let's talk about the headline for a minute. The headline that was published in the online version only of the article on December 18th, 2018, said, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. A few points here. Number one, and this evidence is undisputed. There's no dispute about this. So as you weigh the evidence, you, you, you don't have to check your common sense at the door, and you can weigh circumstantial evidence, you can weigh facts, but you can't see evidence where no evidence exists. And the undisputed evidence here is that Ms. Heard didn't write the headline, she didn't approve the headline, she had nothing to do with it. She was not given notice of the headline. She testified, you saw her testify about the sexual assault that she experienced at the hands of Mr. Depp. You saw her testify about that, that they're calling her a liar. You saw her on the stand testify with your own mouth, with her own mouth, exactly, exactly what she went through for the first time in court because people who have suffered that, they don't want to broadcast that to the world. They want to penalize Ms. Heard for not speaking about that earlier. That's ridiculous and it's insulting and it's just victim blaming at its most disgusting. The only reference to sexual assault in the article, and you can read the op-ed, is sexual assault that she said she had experienced by the time she was of college age before Mr. Depp. So there is a reference to sexual violence in that article. But it's not by Mr. Depp. And Mr. Depp can't hold her liable for a headline she didn't write that contained something that had nothing that was not about him. And they want you to think that she republished the headline, republished the headline by tweeting out the link to the online version. So let's look at this. This is the tweet that she sent on December 19th. The hyperlink says, Opinion Amber Heard, I spoke up against sexual violence. That's the online version of the article. As Ms. Heard said, you can't attach, you can't tweet a piece of paper. So when she wanted to share that she had written this article, what choice does she have? She has to attach that link. And the jury instructions that you have make clear that a hyperlink is not republication. Forwarding a link on does not mean that you broadcast the statement again, but that's what they want to make you think. The only way and the jury instructions that you have, and we, won't, we don't need to read through them in detail now, but the republication instruction says that merely linking to an article does not amount to republication, but adding content to a linked article may constitute republication. 
You must determine whether any added content was intended to reach a new audience. And if you find any content added to the hyperlink was intended to reach a new audience, it constitutes a republication. There was no content added to the article. She tweeted above the article simply saying, today I published this. That's what she said. She didn't add any content to it. She could have added some of the content that you've heard in this courtroom to it. She could have said, not only did two years ago I become a public figure representing domestic abuse, but let me tell you about the domestic abuse that I suffered. That would be adding new content. This is not adding new content. But I guess it's no surprise because this whole case is about blaming Amber Heard for things she didn't do. But that's what Mr. Depp does. It's what he's always done. Blame other people, refuse to take accountability. But the problem for him here is that he's running headlong into the United States Constitution, which says that you cannot hold Amber Heard liable for words she didn't write or publish. But here we are. Here we are. And you can decide this case without ever wading into any of the allegations, the facts, the evidence that you've heard about the heinous abuse that Ms. Heard suffered at the hands of Mr. Depp. You can decide that by the determining that those statements are true and that they're protected by the First Amendment. But Mr. Depp brought this case and he's suggesting that he was never abusive to Ms. Heard. So if that's where you want to make your decision, that's where the road ends for Mr. Depp. Ladies and gentlemen, let me be very clear. If Amber was abused by Mr. Depp even one time, then she wins. One time. And we're not just talking about physical abuse. We're talking about emotional abuse, psychological abuse, financial abuse, sexual abuse. That's what we're talking about. Let's look at the evidence. You heard Mr. Depp define abuse from his own mouth. He admitted all of that when he talked about his childhood. As they reference, his mother called him one eye because he had a lazy eye. And he said that that was worse than the beatings that he took. Worse than the beatings that he took. Being called one eye by his mother was worse than the beatings that he took. And after the evidence that you've seen, some of which you're going to see, I want you to think to yourself, is being called one eye worse than what he did to Miss Heard? Absolutely not. You'll remember his expert, Shannon Curry, agreed with all that, that abuse can take many forms. And you'll remember that Don Hughes, Ms. Heard's expert, talked about the reports of intimate partner violence by Ms. Heard, characterized by physical violence, psychological aggression, sexual violence, coercive control, and surveillance behaviors. She tested Ms. Heard. She said that the tests show that there's a high degree of serious violence perpetrated by Mr. Depp toward Ms. Heard. She got that opinion and that impression by reviewing the medical records of Ms. Heard. She talked about the role of coercive control that Mr. Depp exercised over Ms. Heard. The effect of coercive control, she said, was drastic. And it was composed of things such as possessive jealousy, the imbalance of power, not only in physical stature and physical size, but in where they were in their life and their career. By intimidation, she said writing obscene messages to your partner can absolutely be intimidating behavior. She said that Mr. Depp, after reviewing the evidence, banging and throwing and hitting things in the household, that's psychological aggression. Punching a wall, throwing something, screaming, that is abuse. That's abuse, ladies and gentlemen. She said alcohol can just throw lighter fluid off a flame in a situation of domestic violence. All of these things constitute the domestic violence that Ms. Heard suffered at the hands of Mr. Depp. And he's trying to get you, to fool you, to believing that he's carried his burden of proof that never a single time in their relationship was he in any way, physically or non-physically, abusive to Ms. Heard. And that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. So let's look at some of that evidence. And like I said, you can apply your own common sense. You don't need to check that at the door when you go into the deliberation room. I'm going to walk you through the evidence, some of the evidence that's been presented, including evidence from Mr. Depp's own mouth, his own words, or the words of his witnesses. Keep in mind the burden of proof. And as we go through this evidence, I'd ask you to keep this in mind as well. It's not about who's the better spouse. It's not about whether you think Ms. Heard may have been abusive to Mr. Depp. It's not. 
Because remember, if you think that they were both abusive to each other, and that's what their witness, Laurel Anderson, testified to, then Amber wins. They're trying to trick you into thinking that Amber has to be perfect in order to win, even while they're ignoring Jay, Mr. Depp's many flaws. But don't fall for that trick. Amber's not perfect. None of us are. She's never pretended to be, and that's not what you're being asked to decide. One time, ladies and gentlemen, one time, if he abused her one time, Amber wins. Actually, if he fails to prove that he never abused her one time, Amber wins. So let's take a look at some of the evidence. This was one of the first messages shown to Mr. Depp in his cross-examination. This is a message to Paul Bettany, his drug buddy, early on in their relationship. When he says, let's burn Amber, let's drown her before we burn her, I will fuck her burnt corpse afterwards to make sure she is dead. Some of the most vile, disgusting language that you could ever imagine. That is what he said to her at the beginning of the relationship. So let's look at how the relationship was bookended. You remember Mr. Depp the other day in response to some texts that we'll see later saying, I don't write like that. This is a bookend of the relationship. This is after it was over. I asked Mr. Depp to read that top text. You'll remember that was the only thing I asked him to read. And he immediately said, I didn't write that text, even though, of course he did. Even though he wrote the text underward, uh, under it that said, hopefully that cunt's rotting corpse is decomposing in the fucking trunk of a Honda Civic. That's how he bookended their relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, these words are a window into the heart and mind of America's favorite pirate. This is the real Johnny Depp. This is the real Johnny Depp after Miss Heard decided that she couldn't take it anymore, decided that she needed to leave him. And I'm not going to reread this whole text to you. But this is where she, he says she's begging for global humiliation. And she's going to get it. He says, I'll stop at nothing, and I can only hope that karma kicks in and takes the gift of breath from her. It's one of the only promises to Mr. Miss Heard that Mr. Depp has ever kept. That's how he ended the relationship, but you saw how he started it. Now, Miss Heard did testify on the stand that Mr. Depp abused her countless times. At first, it started, they, they were very happy. They started dating in 2011. And things were good. And she testified that even during periods of abuse, even during their relationship, when there was abuse occurring, that there were periods where they were very happy. It's the cycle of violence. It's the cycle of sobriety. There were periods when everything was good, when the monster was gone, and then the monster would return. You heard about how the first incident of incidents of violence took place in 2012, when Ms. Heard asked Johnny about his tattoo that used to say Winona forever and had been changed to say Wino forever. And she laughed. And she said, and he slapped me across the face. She thought it was a joke. And then he did it two more times. And then he said, I thought I put the monster away and I've done it before. That's what she, he said to her during that first incidence of violence. But you don't just have to take what Mr. Depp said in his text, we can hear through his own voice what he called Miss Heard. Because you're a fucking cunt! We talked about the monster. You heard Mr. Depp get on the stand and say that that was Miss Heard's term. It, she made it up. That was what she used to refer to him when she was nagging him because she didn't want him to have a good time. She didn't want him to have a beer once in a while. That's what he's implying. But no, this was a term created by Mr. Depp that she heard for the first time in 2012 after he slapped her three times across the face and said, I thought I put the monster away. And after he sat up here on the stand under oath and told you that she made that term up, we look back at his texts, the writing at the time, the first text is after Australia in 2015, during a period of sobriety, a short-lived period of recovery for Mr. Depp, when he told Jerry Judge, his bodyguard, all I had to do was send the monster away and lock him up. 
Remember he texted Elton John or sent an email to Elton John in 2012 referring to himself as the monster. He tells Dr. Kipper, the doctor to whom he's paid millions and millions and millions of dollars, thank you, my darling Kipper. He says, I've locked my monster child away in a cage deep within. He tells Stephen Duders, you know Mr. Duders, he liked to text Mr. Duders. He tells him, she thinks my Peruvian, Peruvian period, which is a reference to cocaine, he admitted to that, that that means him using cocaine, has made me a monster and that I am ruining the relationship. Imagine that, someone actually thinking that maybe the impact of alcohol and cocaine is ruining a relationship. How dare she? He says, need to discuss the news helicopters. The monster, I want to shoot a motherfucker, but don't worry, the monster is not, not involved. Mr. Depp knows that he can turn into a monster. He knows that. He knows that. He got up here on the sand and tried to deny that to you. Talk about lack of accountability. Let's see the monster. Let's see the monster in the flesh. I just woke up and you were so sweet and nice. We were not even fighting this morning. All I did was say sorry. Did something happen to you this morning? I don't think so. Um, no, that's the thing. You want to see crazy? I'll give you fucking crazy. That's crazy. Oh, you're crazy. Crazy. Have you drunk this whole thing this morning? Oh, you got this. You got this so going. I just started it. Oh, really? Yes. Really? See that shit on me? No, I didn't. You were smashing shit. Oh, bye. see miss her laughing in that she's not laughing in that mr. Depp in this courtroom right now is laughing and making snide remarks as that video is being played but it's not a laughing matter who does that who does that imagine being in Amber's shoes on February 10th 2016 videotaping him when he's because when he's sober and sweet you've never loved anything more but when he mixes the drugs and he mixes drinks he turns into this man you've seen it before you're praying it won't happen again, but deep down you know it will. You know that that man will come out. You know that monster will come out, and you want him to change. Imagine watching your husband, the person you love, behaving violently that way, like a wild animal. That is abuse. That's abuse. And you don't have to look at that incident in isolation to find that it's abuse. You can look at it in the context of their whole relationship. This isn't about breaking down a series of individual days that you've heard evidence about. This is about the, the, the cumulative effect of Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard's relationship and whether that constitutes abuse. That is abuse, ladies and gentlemen. That's domestic abuse. And their response is, she sold it to TMZ, which she didn't. There's no evidence of. And she was on a plane. The only evidence suggests she was on an international flight when Mr. Tremaine testified that they received it and it was validated within something like 15 minutes, which could only have happened by the person who sent it. Ms. Heard was in the air. 
She didn't send it to TMZ. She never leaked anything to TMZ, as you heard from her own mouth. Who would want that to become public? Again, in order to find for Mr. Depp, you would have to find that for his defamation claim, every single thing that ever happened between them that could constitute abuse, Amber was the abuser. Every single time. You have to believe the unbelievable. You all are smarter than that. But Mr. Depp thought he could hide it. He thought he could hide the monster. That's why he lied in insurance forms that you have to fill out in order to be able to act. That's why he said he hadn't taken illegal substances, whether pres prescribed by a physician or not. That obviously wasn't true in the past 12 months. They keep talking about Mr. Depp's role as a father. This is what he, what he sent, a text that he sent in DX207. Now Lily Rose, his daughter, hates me because she thinks I'm drinking and she's right, but I can't admit or I fucking die in her eyes. Thanks for that one, Vanessa. This is Mr. Depp passed out in a Tokyo hotel room during the press tour for the Lone Ranger in 2013, when Ms. Heard testified that Mr. Depp screamed at me, and all I could think were the kids are in an adjoining room, and Mr. Depp passed out with his head like this. I don't think he was sleeping on the floor because he had a bad back. They keep referring to these pictures as she took pictures of Mr. Depp while he was asleep. He's not asleep in that picture. He's passed out, drunk and high, and she's taking pictures because she wants him to realize what he's done and get help and seek help. I don't think that looks like the spice cabinet of anyone in this courtroom. That's Mr. Depp. This is Mr. Depp. This is Mr. Depp. This is Mr. Depp. And all you hear from Mr. Depp when these pictures are shown, is snickering and defiance. Victim blaming, blaming Ms. Heard for taking this picture of him, for trying to help. So let's talk about some of these instances of abuse. Oh, forgot one. In March 2013, talked about the, the Wino Forever tattoo. In March 2013, there were a couple instances. There was one where on March 8th, and we'll get to that in a, in a second, where he was drinking brown liquor and doing a lot of cocaine. Or that might have been March, sorry, that was March 22nd. On March 8th, this is when Mr. Depp backhanded her. She felt like her lip went into her teeth and got a little blood on the wall. He grabbed her by the arm and held her on the floor, screaming at her. We'll come back to this in a minute. This is March 22nd. This is what Mr. Depp said, isn't every hour happy hour? Again, totally abandoning any responsibility for behavior like this. But what happened on March 22nd is he wanted Ms. Heard to remove a painting by her ex-partner, and he wanted to admit to an affair that she wasn't having. She didn't admit to it because it wasn't true. So he decided to have some lines of cocaine and some whiskey for breakfast. And then, on the way to filming the Keith Richards documentary, after a multi-hour argument, he grabbed their dog, their teacup Yorkie, and holds the dog, Boo, out of the window of a moving car. And he's howling like an animal, Miss Heard said, while holding the dog out of the car. That is abuse, ladies and gentlemen. That's abuse. Let's go back to this, because... Ms. Vasquez read a parade of witnesses that she believes support Johnny's defense in this case. But as you've seen over the course of this proceeding, these witnesses, as I previewed in the opening, almost all of them are witnesses on his payroll. They're all scared to say anything bad about him. And they've seen what happens to people who do. And none were there for the instances of domestic violence. What they're saying is, oh, if he didn't abuse Ms. Heard in front of his four bodyguards, and it must have never happened. That's essentially what they're asking you to believe. That's ridiculous. That's not the way domestic violence works. Take his sister, Christy. I know it seems like a year ago, but she was the first witness in this case. 
you remember her on the stand when I presented her with these texts that say, stop drinking, stop Coke, and stop pills. You remember her squirming and saying, oh, I don't think I was asking him to stop drinking, stop Coke, stop pills. She couldn't even answer that basic question because she wanted to lie for Mr. Depp and say that it, Ms. Hurd was delusional. She couldn't even admit this to you. She's nothing but an enabler. The same with Sean Bett, his head of security, who's been sitting in this courtroom for the past six weeks. He's right there. Mr. Bett was the one who testified to you that when Mr. Depp has a few drinks of alcohol, he said, I wrote this down, he said it's like the rest of us drinking sparkling water. I don't think that kitchen video that we just saw was like you or I when we drink sparkling water. This is the same Sean Bett who said that on the evening of May 21st, 2016, which Elaine will talk about in a little bit, he said Mr. Depp may have bumped something off a table. You've seen the pictures. You'll see them again. Just like Travis McGivern said that Mr. Depp rearranged Ms. Hurd's closet. You've seen the pictures. You'll see them again. Just like Tara Roberts in the Bahamas, who tried to blame everything on Ms. Hurd and only under cross-examination admitted that Mr. Depp passed out face down in the sand underneath a hammock and his son Jack found him there. She took a video of their cabin in the Bahamas to try to suggest to you that this assault that Ms. Hurd alleges couldn't have taken place. But conveniently, she didn't take the camera into the closet where Mr. Depp held Ms. Hurd, <coughs> hit her. We'll get to that incident. She didn't take the video camera into the bathroom where he sexually assaulted Ms. Hurd. She didn't do that because she wanted to generate evidence only favorable to Mr. Depp. Think about Sean Bett and Starling Jenkins' conflicting stories about the birthday party on April 21st. Remember, Mr. Depp experienced horrific financial news the evening uh, of that night, April 21st, 2016. He learned that he was essentially out of money and he needed to start selling things. Well, we all know what Mr. Depp does when he receives bad news like that. He left the meeting at 9.30 and didn't arrive at Ms. Hurd's birthday party until 11.15. Okay, fine, he was late. But we all know what he does when he has that hour and 45 minutes of free time and he's stressed out about something. Mr. Bett testified, remember he said, I took him to his home on Sweetser Avenue, his other home, to pick up a birthday present for Ms. Hurd. That's what he said. That's what he said. Mr. Jenkins, you'll, you may remember him, he testified by the video link on the stand, and I said, you don't know what he did in that intervening time period. And he said, oh yes, I do, I do. He said, Mr. Depp was visiting his sick mother. And I said, who told you that? And he said, Mr. Bett. The witnesses that Mr. Depp has paraded up here, who are here in person, they're here in person because they're on his payroll, almost all of them. And they're telling you whatever they think they need to tell you to get you to take Mr. Depp's side, just as we previewed they would do in the opening. But Mr. Depp would go through periods where he would apologize, where he would be grateful. I have no doubt that there were times when Mr. Depp wanted to get better. These are texts, PX 120A and 120B. I won't read them all to you. These are texts that Mr. Depp sent to Paige Hurd, Amber's mom, after detox on the island in 2014. He says, there were more than a few times when I thought it would be more simple to take that route. Meaning, go for a swim and swallow a big drink of ocean. And he said, it was Amber and Amber alone that got me through this. There is no luckier man on this earth to have the strength that Amber gives me and the full support of each of you. So as you're weighing the evidence and you're weighing Mr. Depp's credibility, think to yourself, what do I believe? What he has a motive to say on the stand or what he wrote contemporaneously with the events? Take his own words to Amber after the detox. Just to let you know that I'm fine, my angel. I miss you, of course, but this was the right thing to do to speed up the process. I love you more than life. But then there were these days. Then there were times like this. This is sent on March 9th. We had a slightly grim morning, is the way Mr. Depp describes it. You'll remember the text from a few days later, referred to as the disco bloodbath text, 
where Ms. Hurd says, is that about last Friday night by any chance? And Mr. Depp responds, how can you make me smile about such a hideous moment? He testified on the stand, I don't remember what happened that Friday night, but Ms. Hurd sure did. And this, this is what, one of the things that she had to show for it. Now, Ms. Vasquez showed this to you in opening statements and made it seem like, again, remember what I said at the beginning, if you take pictures, they're fake. If you didn't take pictures, it didn't happen. Here's one where she did take a picture, but Ms. Vasquez says, but she doesn't have injuries on her face. Look at the date that this picture was taken, ladies and gentlemen, March 23rd, 2013, 15 days after this incident. So even when there are pictures, they're trying to deceive you into thinking, oh, there should have been more. This is a two week old bruise. And she texts it, look who she texts that to. She texts it to her mom. They say, she never told anyone. Text to mom, March 23rd, 2013. Let's go to Hicksville. You remember Hicksville, obviously. There's been a little bit of discussion about that in this case. This is where Mr. Depp got jealous that a woman named Kelly Sue was sitting close to Miss Hurd and maybe had her arm around her at a campfire. And everyone was having a good time. There were some mushrooms involved. Um, there was some drinking. And Mr. Depp got jealous of that. Now he claims that Miss Hurd is the abuser, that she's so much stronger than he is. But then he testified that the evidence shows that in Hicksville, he was the one who said he was just trying to protect Amber. Well, who says, why would she need protection if she's the abuser? And he went and he took Kelly Sue's hand, forcibly removed it from Miss Heard, embarrassing Miss Heard, ruining the mood of the whole night. So they went and they got into an argument in the trailer in which not only did he trash the trailer, but he took her into the bathroom. He slammed her up against the side wall of the bedroom by her neck, holds her there. Um, and no, sorry, that, he, that, was, that was the next one. In Hicksville, he took her into the bathroom of the trailer and did what he called a cavity search, where he inserted his fingers inside of her and sexually assaulted her, then trashed the trailer. And you heard this Morgan Knight person who testified a few days ago who said it was $62 of damage. You also heard evidence that the way he got involved in this trial was by uh, reaching out to uh, a, uh, one of the main Johnny Depp fans fan influencers on social media. And you saw that text. That's how he injected himself into this trial. There was way more than $62 of damage. You heard testimony from Rocky Pennington, Whitney Heard, Whitney Enriquez, and Amber about him trashing the trailer. And is that really a surprise? The man's admitted that he smashes things when he gets angry. The man's admitted that he smashed hotel rooms. You saw the quote that he admitted to the other day that when he wants to hit something, he's gonna hit it and he doesn't care about the repercussions. So in Hicksville, this is, the Hicksville was late May 2013. This is a text, another text to drug buddy Betney, where he says, I, of course, pounded and displayed ugly colors to Amber on recent journey. I am an insane person and not so fair headed after too much of the drink. Weed, pills, fine. Booze, my capacity is too large and I won't stop. Ugly and sad. Oh, how I love it. There appears to be an amber alert, but I think we're okay. It's, people are getting it, I guess, on their phones that haven't silenced that. Oh, okay, Your Honor. Okay. Can I keep going? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. So that's, that's after Hicksville. This, this is what I was getting to next. This, remember uh, the testimony about Mr. Depp being drunk on his yacht on the island in the Bahamas in 2013, when Mr. Depp looked a little scary by the way his body fell into the water and Lily Rose, his daughter, started to cry. Miss Heard comforted Lily Rose and then Depp accused Amber of making them aware of this, that he was drinking again, making his kids aware of this. And he slammed her up against the sidewall of the bedroom, held her up by her neck, held her there for a second and said, I can fucking kill you and you're an embarrassment. That's what he said. And then do you remember what happened? Lily Rose and Amber helicoptered away from the island. And while Amber was in the helicopter with Lily Rose, Mr. Depp sends her this piece of poetry. 
calling her a lesbian camp counselor because she cared about his drinking and just ridiculing her for trying to protect his daughter. It's sickening. This text, well, let's fast forward a little bit to, uh, actually, before we talk about this, this is the Boston flight. Let's talk about the Moscow flight. The Moscow flight, when Mr. Depp and Amber, she said that was the one time she took ecstasy or MDMA with Mr. Depp, and she learned her lesson. When he hit her on the plane, when he threatened to break the flight attendant's wrist, and Miss Vasquez, again, just tried to tell you, oh, he always wore rings. Now, Miss Heard said almost all the time he did, or maybe sometimes when he didn't. And in the picture that she just showed you, PX 1248, you can take a look at that when you review the evidence. That's a picture taken in Moscow with no rings other than a wedding ring on his finger or some kind of ring. He's wearing one ring on his finger. And so in Mr. Depp's world, they're going to try to come at you either way. They say, well, he was wearing rings, but it didn't leave a mark on your face. And then they show you a picture where he wasn't wearing rings during that trip. So that's what happened in Moscow. On September 2013, in London, Mr. Depp He started throwing things at her, ice cubes and utensils. And he slapped her face against the window when she was seated. And when she got up to move, how dare she? He kicked her in the back. She said, I feel this food in my back. And he continued to drink and eventually started howling like an animal, passed out in the bathroom. Let's play 221, please. Mr. Depp on the plane, but he expects you to believe him that he didn't have anything to drink on that plane except for maybe one thing of champagne. That's what he expects you to believe. He's talked about blackouts. He's blackouts where he doesn't remember what happened. He blamed them only on opiates, but we know they happen throughout where he doesn't remember what's happened. As you're weighing the evidence, as you're assessing whether Mr. Depp has borne his burden of proof, think to yourself, do you believe Amber's account of what happened on the plane, or do you believe that person's account that you just heard. But actually, you can look at his account from a few days later, May 30th, in which he told, again, Paul Bettany, he said, drank all night before I picked Amber up to fly to LA. No food for days, powders, half a bottle of whiskey, a thousand Red Bulls and vodkas, pills, two bottles of champagne, and what do you get? An angry aggro engine in a fucking blackout, screaming obscenities and insulting any fuck who got near. I'm done. I'm admittedly too fucked in the head to spray my rage at the one I love. For little reason as well, I'm too old to be that guy, but pills are fine. And he expects you to believe that he's carried his burden of proof in showing that no abuse happened on that plane. 
You don't have to look at just that. You can look at this text of Patty Smith. When he says, when I was in NYC, they were brief visits and I fucked and charged by horrific fights with Amber. I fucked up and drank and got shitty, was so disappointed in myself. You can look at his text to Miss Heard the next day where he says, once again, I find myself in a place of shame and regret. Of course, I'm sorry. I really don't know why or what happened. Well, no wonder. You heard the voice on the plane. Of course, he doesn't know what happened. But I will never do it again. My illness somehow crept up and grabbed me. I must get better. I love you and feel so bad for letting you down. And what his response has been throughout this trial to things like that is blaming Amber, saying he's just placating her. Is that carrying his burden of proof and showing that abuse hasn't happened even a single time? This is in the lead up to Australia. But before we get there, we can talk about January 25th in Tokyo at the premiere of Mordecai, where he did slam her up against the hallway wall, wailed on her, and he did get on her back in the closet. And what do they say? Look at her backless dress. She doesn't have any bruises. She testified herself that she was checking out pictures because she was concerned that there were. So now their theory is if there's no marks, it didn't happen. We all know that's not the case. February 2015, this is when they got married. The day they got married, you heard the testimony from Io Tillett Wright that where Mr. Depp told him, I can now punch her anytime I want and no one can do anything about it. He'll say it's a joke, a joke he made on his wedding day. Then we fast forward to Australia where Miss Heard is flying from London where she's filming the Danish girl to see her new husband for the first time since their wedding. And these are excerpts from DX353, all but the bottom right one, are in the days leading up to this, where he's on a drug-fueled bender. He's hanging out with Marilyn Manson. He's getting drugs from his assistants who are enablers. Again, there's a reason you didn't hear them testify in this trial. They're getting him drugs for days and days. And then the one on the bottom right, you'll remember, you've seen a couple times, this is after he chopped his finger off when he says, need more cocaine and ecstasy. So, and no one, Miss Heard was in touch with his assistants, but no one told her the hornet's nest that she was walking into. And we all know what happened in Australia. We all know that Mr. Depp, she gets there, he pulls out a bag of MDMA, and he took a handful. She didn't say he took 10 at a time. She did say he took eight to 10 over the course of that period. The second day, Mr. Depp, who claims that Miss Heard um, refused to do a post snuff calls Amber's domestic relations attorney, Michelle Mulrooney, you heard from her, when he was drunk and he fired her. And he told Amber for about the 25th time, she said, the only way out of this is death. I don't want to post up. And then she said she remembered him slamming up against the wall. And I won't go through, you remember her testimony from Australia. You remember her saying that he had her by the neck, squeezing her neck. You remember her saying that he threw her on the games table like a ping pong table. You remember seeing the pictures of that broken table. You remember her saying that at some point he had a broken bottle up against her face and he told her that he'd carve up her face, that he was throwing bottles at her. He's throwing bottles one after another and I could feel glass breaking behind me and you've seen the evidence of that. And he was just over and over again smashing the phone into the wall, screaming at me as she watched it break into pieces. Now, she doesn't know how he lost his finger. She said that she saw him smash a phone to pieces and you heard him get impeached the other day with his testimony from the UK, which was different from what he testified here, where he said he did smash a phone. And then they tried to put that picture in front of you with a desk phone and suggest that that was it. It's deception. They're trying to deceive you. And then you heard Ms. Heard testify that the next morning she found meat that he had left all over the house, but not before what happened before she went to bed that night where Miss Heard testified, and I remember trying to get up and I was slipping on the glass. I was wanting to move, he, I, I felt this pressure, pressure in my pubic bone. I remember just not wanting to move because I didn't know if it was broken. I didn't know if the bottle that he, he had inside me was broken. This is the next morning. This is what he wrote with the bloody stump of his finger. And there's been testimony about 
what happened to cut the finger off. But frankly, it's irrelevant to your deliberations here. Amber could have chopped it off with an ax, and it has nothing to do with whether or not Mr. Depp abused her. But we all know she didn't. We all know that his fingers weren't curled, and someone was standing with a half-gallon vodka bottle from about where that canopy is, and threw it, and it somehow managed to damage just the bottom of the finger and leave the nail fully intact. We all know that didn't happen. Mr. Depp knows it didn't happen. We'll see some evidence of that. But here, he writes about her ambition, starring Billy Bob and Easy Amber, who talked about controlling jealousy, talked about him not wanting her to act. Don Hughes testified how that is a form of intimate partner abuse. Here, she write, he's writing on the, the mirror again, and they try to blame her and say that she wrote Call Carly Simon. She didn't write that. Who was the lunatic in the house? Who was writing everywhere? She, there's no evidence she wrote that. She testified she doesn't even know who Carly Simon was until she was told. This is some of the evidence. Mr. Depp told you a couple different stories the other day about the, the evidence on the right. He claimed that that was the handle of vodka between those two beer cans there. But then under cross-examination, he admitted it's not, that there's not enough glass on the floor, that there's no handle of vodka on the floor. But what there is in the picture on the right is evidence of when he was throwing bottles past Amber's head and breaking that plate glass window. More writing, more abuse on the right. Imagining having a painting area where you're drawing two canvases and you and your husband get in a fight and while you are asleep that night, he takes the bloody stump of his finger and dips it in paint and destroys your paintings. Ladies and gentlemen, that's abuse. Good luck and be careful at the top. And this is a good chance to talk about Mr. Jeff's Mr. Depp's controlling and jealous rage and his desire to control Amber's career. He didn't want her to act. As early as 2013, he tells his sister, I don't need actress bullshit and her fucking ambition. He tells her in this recording, I became irrational when you're doing movies. I become jealous and fucking crazy and weird. And, you know, we fight a lot more. I become jealous when you're doing movies. I become irrational and fucking crazy and weird. Out of his own mouth. This is some of the notes of Dr. Blaustein, his therapist, called him self destructive. Something about wait up to fight the devil. Jealous, and I know this is hard, hard to read, but you can see jealous, you can see paranoia, fear, envy. He wanted to control her. He wanted to own her. He didn't want her to have any career. And then he says things like, I have other uses for your throat, which do not include injury. No one who hasn't previously grabbed someone by the throat would write, which do not include injury. But we all know how Mr. Death thinks along these lines, because you saw these two texts the other day, that he sat on the stand and denied writing. And I'm not gonna read them to you again, because they're the most vulgar, vile writing you can imagine. He said, that's not my style, I wouldn't write like that. <laughs> of course he would, and he did. These are texts that he produced, that he gave to Amber and our team in this litigation, from him to his personal assistant, Stephen Duders. This is the way he thinks about women. This, not what you heard on the stand, that. It's disgusting. He admitted that he cut his finger off. These, this is evidence of him admitting to it to people other than Amber. I cut the top of my middle finger off. He says that to Dr. Kipper. Says it again to Dr. Kipper. The bottom one he says, says to Nurse Velotti. I just chopped my finger off. But he does say it to Amber, too. Remember, we played this one four times, and Mr. Depp denied that he was actually saying, the day that I chopped my finger off. Let's hear it one more time. No, I don't know. I'm talking about Australia, the day that no, I chopped my finger off. No, we're talking about Australia. Off. Okay. The day that I chopped my finger off. So let's fast forward to March 23rd, 2015. After just a few weeks in Australia, Mr. Depp has a finger injury, no doubt about that. He comes home. He gets what they call a soft cast on it, which you heard his treating physician and our experts say doesn't have sides on it, but it's a hard plaster cast over the top of his finger that can be wielded like a club. And they got in an argument when Miss Heard discovered that he was having an affair with a woman named Rochelle that had been going on before the wedding, after the wedding, and she confronted him about that. 
No surprise there. They got in a huge argument. At some point in the argument, he bolted up the stairs. Now, Travis McGivern claims that she threw a Red Bull can at him. She and Whitney Enriquez say that absolutely didn't happen. But even if you believe Mr. McGivern, at some point, Mr. Depp went up the stairs. He went to the fight. This is the man that claims he always wants to run, and this time he had his bodyguard with him. So he could have just walked out the door, but he runs up the stairs, and Miss Enriquez is standing on the precipice of the stairs, and Amber admitted that when she thought he was about to push her down the stairs, as he's grabbing at her and Amber with his free hand and trying to club them with the casted hand, that she said, I punched him square in the face. I punched him square in the face. And they showed you a picture of the shiner that she had, that, that, that Mr. Depp had. Ms. Heard doesn't deny that. They're trying to say she's the abuser for defending herself and her sister from this animal who's running at them. This person that they claim couldn't possibly have done this because he had a hurt finger. Yet he could have done this. This is what Mr. McGivern said was rearranging her closet. I don't know what you all do when you rearrange your closets, but I hope it doesn't look like this. This is throwing a clothing rack down the stairs. This is knocking this over. This is what he did to rearrange her closet with his hurt finger that he couldn't possibly have hit Miss Heard with, they claim. That in and of itself, that destruction of property, even if he hadn't hit her that night, that's abuse. Imagine being married to someone and walking on eggshells so thick that you don't know if you set them off if that's what's going to happen. That's abuse. And it's disgusting. But sometimes he would apologize. He'd say, I can't express how sorry I am for having stooped so low as to have spewed such vicious untruths for the sole purpose of hurting you. Grievous error, shameful. So he went in these cycles. He went in these cycles. She thought he could change for good. And when it was good, it was really good. But then sometimes things like December 15th came around where she remembers him chasing her in the kitchen. She remembers him shoving her two or three times and sending her toppling over a chase lounge and saying, do you really want to go again, tough guy? And she looked at him and he balled up his fist, leaned back and headbutted her square in the nose and pounded her head with the back of his fist so she couldn't breathe on that bed that we're going to see in a second, where she was suffocating in this pillow top and she said, this is when I thought I was going to die. He's going to kill me and he doesn't even know what he's doing because he's out of his mind. And these are the pictures that they claim. I don't know what they're claiming. I don't know if they're claiming she painted on the bruise. Oh, you weren't hurt badly enough, so therefore you're making it up. Look under her eye. And again, their theory is that all of this is a lie. All of this was some grand hoax. If this were a hoax, ladies and gentlemen, she'd have worse injuries than that. She'd really do it up. She took pictures as they existed, when she could at the time of abuse. And yet Ms. Vasquez has the nerve to say, well, why didn't she videotape an incident of abuse? What, if she's being hit, she's supposed to somehow grab a video camera with one hand while she's defending herself with another hand? You heard her in one of the audio tapes talking about when she hit him as he was trying to barge at her and she got her feet caught under a door as he's coming after her. And of course, as Don Hughes testified to, victims, of course, of control like this, they do try to, to appease their abusive partner and apologize for things that aren't their fault. So as you're coming at me, Johnny, and you push a door into me, and I have to hit you to get away to protect myself, yeah, she did apologize for that because that's the cycle of violence. That's what victims do. Yet, yet they continue to blame the victim. There's no evidence she painted on that bloody lip. And again, if we're talking about a hoax, the next day she went on James Ford and they say, well, you can't see any injury there, so it must not have been. She would have to be <laughs> the dumbest person in the world to say, I'm going to commit an abuse hoax, but let's, let's do it the day before I go on national television. <laughs> let's do it the day before. But you heard Melanie Iglesias, her makeup artist, testify in great detail. And I didn't even understand half the terms about makeup that she was using. But she testified in great detail about exactly what she did to cover up those bruises. The red lipstick that she put to cover up the busted lip. You heard the testimony of that from a neutral party 
who said exactly what she did. She talked about how she looked at the color wheel to neutralize the bruising. They claim it was just an accidental headbutt. Well, no accidental headbutt rips out hair. They claim, oh, Miss Hurd somehow used a pocket knife to cut this portion of the bed out to stage this. Well, I don't know if that's a pocket knife or not, but the only testimony in this trial about a pocket knife is Whitney Enriquez saying that Mr. Depp carried a pocket knife in his pocket every day. We all know where that, if it is a pocket knife, where that came from. I think the most telling, one of the most telling things about this incident is the text he sent to David Hurd, Amber's dad, two weeks later, where he says, I meant to send this to you a week or so ago. I'm sending it to you now. And he says, I forget if it's a text or an email, but you can look at the X580. He says, yes, I fucked up and went too far in our fight. Because as a result of that fight and the bruises that all of her family saw, the fam family refused to go to the Bahamas with them for Christmas. The family refused to go to the Bahamas for Christmas, and on that trip to the island, Mr. Depp kept passing out, and every time he passed out, he would dump a glass of wine on Amber's lap. And she didn't like that, and she yelled at him. And because, because it was in front of his kids, he got up. This is the one where Tara Roberts took the video, but she didn't show you the closet, she didn't show you the bathroom, and Amber says, while holding my neck, this is in the closet. He said, I'll fucking kill you if you ever speak to me like that in front of my kids again because you embarrass me. And then he took her into the bathroom and she said, but this time he grabbed my vagina, shoved his fingers inside me, but through my bathing suit and held me there and asked me if I was so fucking tough. And then she ran out of the house and to keep him away from her, that's when he claims, and she, she admits, she threw something at him. She didn't know what it was. There's, it's been testimony, it was a can of mineral spirits that she claimed that, that, that hit Mr. Depp. And Mr. Depp is somehow the victim in that encounter? Come on. We talk about the, plane, the train ride to Asia. We, you saw the pictures taken before they got on the train ride where Mr. Depp has the same shadowing under his eye that he does in the allegedly abusive picture. But in that picture, he held Mr. or in that train ride, talk about a honeymoon, he held her up against the wall while she was trying to get his arms off her neck and he was squeezing her neck against the railway car and at some point I pulled the lapel of his shirt, he rips the shirt off and she woke up with the shirt around her neck and a giant knot in the back of her head. Let's fast forward to uh, her birthday party just very quickly. He experienced terrible financial news that night. He came over, they got into a fight. There's been conflicting evidence about that. But Amber said, I hit the side of the desk. He chest bumped me, he fell to the floor, I fell to the floor, and when I got back up, he held me down by the shoulders, and that's when he grabbed her by the pubic bone and pushed her down. And you'll remember Miss Vasquez showing her her interrogatory answers where she details a lot of this and saying, nowhere in there does it say that. And Miss Hurd says, it actually does on page 64, and pointed out to Miss Vasquez exactly where it says that. That's abuse, it's sexual abuse. But we all know what Mr. Depp does when he experiences terrible financial news, or terrible news. He experienced terrible news that night on the way to the birthday party where his, both of his bodyguards have testified that he was either visiting his sick mom or getting a birthday present for Amber. And then we know what happens the day after his mother passed away on May 21st, 2016. And we're gonna skip through a little bit of this now, and Elaine will talk about this in the context of the counterclaim, but these are the pictures afterwards. These are pictures that now they're claiming that, well, they must have been fake. There's been no testimony in this case that these pictures were faked. There's been no testimony that the marks you see on Amber's face, including this mark with a straight line from below her eye to the top of her temple that it lines up directly with a phone. There's been no testimony that those are faked. Mr. Depp went through the house. He destroyed pictures of her friends. That's abuse. Property destruction like that, it, it, in and of itself, is abuse. He destroyed her office. He destroyed her friend Rocky Pennington's um, preparation for the bead show that she was having. He spilled wine in the hallway that you'll notice the police denied. Oh, there was no spilled wine in the hallway. Well, even Isaac Baruch testified that he saw this in the hallway. And they said she never sent thing to her medical providers. These are the texts that she sent to her nurse, Erin Filati, the night that it happened. These are pictures of her in the courtroom We're not going to play this right now, but you can listen to this. This is that terribly disturbing text of him in July of 2016 threatening to cut himself and telling, you cut me or I will. 
You all remember playing that. It was awful. It was awful. I'm not going to play it again, but it was, it, was, it was horrible. That in and of itself is abusive. This is the document that Mr. Depp signed, the divorce agreement, where he says, sign in agreement with his signature, neither party has made false accusations for financial gain. He said that then. He could have fought this then, but he didn't because he knew that her allegations were true. But then he continued his campaign of humiliation. He says, I want her replaced on that WB film. Ladies and gentlemen, the facts are absolutely overwhelming of abuse. One time, that's all you have to remember. Mr. Depp simply cannot prove to you that he never once abused Amber. And if you don't, no, you have to return a verdict for Ms. Heard. A ruling against Amber here sends a message that no matter what you do as an abuse victim, you always have to do more. No matter what you document, you always have to document more. No matter, no matter whom you tell, you always have to tell more people. No matter how honest you are about your own imperfections and your own shortcomings in a relationship, you need to be perfect in order for people to believe you. Don't send that message. That's what he wants you to send. So I'm going to quickly get to another point that you have to find in order to prove or in order to rule for Mr. Depp. You would have to find that Ms. Heard made the statements with actual malice. Now, what Mr. Chu didn't tell you is that you have to find this by clear and convincing evidence. So this is much higher than the greater weight of the evidence standard that applies to the other claims, uh, the other elements of the claim. Clear and convincing evidence is evidence that creates in your minds a firm belief or conviction that Mr. Depp has proved this issue. So if you believe that Ms. Heard did not act maliciously in writing her op-ed, then you must return a verdict or misheard, even if you think that he never abused her. But we can, I'll quickly go over the evidence of this. The, the, the op-ed, you look at the words, it clearly wasn't a hit piece. She visited her attorney, Eric George, who testified by video that his objective was to make sure that there could be no meritorious claim that could be brought about this article relating to defamation. He gave Ms. Heard advice. She affirmatively followed all of it. So you cannot find that Ms. Heard met the clear and convincing evidence standard, given the testimony of Eric George, given the testimony of Terrence Doherty from the ACLU, when Amber went out of her way to ask her lawyer if it was OK. They will say it doesn't matter if she's lying. But even if that isn't, um, they will say that that doesn't matter if she's lying. But even that isn't true. Because again, keep in mind that if Ms. Heard wanted to be malicious toward Mr. Depp, the article would be very different. And I think it's interesting here, we'll talk about Mr. Waldman in a second, but that Amber utilized her attorney, Eric George, to make sure that she was following the law. Mr. Depp used his attorney, Adam Waldman, as an attack dog to defame Amber and to fulfill Depp's promise to her of global humiliation. The last thing I'll touch on before Elaine talks is Mr. Depp's damages. The man's at least consistent in one respect. He blames other people for his problems, everyone but himself. You heard us reading the stack of articles dating years before he broke up with Amber, uh, before their marriage broke apart, talking about his problems, talking about the fact that his movies were flops, talking about the fact that he was late to the set, that he's unreliable as an actor. A word of reminder here, ladies and gentlemen, is that the only thing Amber ever did that Mr. Depp is allowed to sue her for is the op-ed. He's trying to say, I want to sue her for what she said in 2016. I want to sue her for harm that was caused then. You cannot do that. The only thing you're being asked to decide is, are the words of the op-ed defamatory. Nothing else. Any damage to Mr. Depp's career is self-caused. Then think about the testimony that you've heard from his former business manager, Joel Mandel, said that Depp had issues with drugs and alcohol that damaged his career. Depp sued him. His former agent, Tracy Jacobs, said he was late to the set and that he used an earpiece. Depp fired her. She said Disney never committed to Pirate 6. Disney's corporate representative, Tina Newman, said that there was no record in Disney's records of this op-ed. This op-ed had nothing to do with it. In fact, Catherine Arnold, our damages expert, testified that the paper version of the article that allegedly they say came out four days after the op-ed was published the same day as the op-ed that said that Johnny might not be in Pirate 6. The same day, the paper article came out the same day. So the op-ed didn't cause that. There's no evidence of any contract by Disney for Pirate 6. His agent, Jack Wiggum, couldn't identify a contract. 
His former agent, Christian Carino, said that there's no contract. He didn't lose anything as a result of this op-ed. Anything he's lost is the result of his own choices. You also heard him lie to you. You heard him tell you that this was his first chance to tell his story. But let's break it down, because that's not true. He could have fought the TRO that Amber filed. He could have said, I didn't abuse her, but he chose not to do that. He could have fought her in the divorce case, but he chose not to do that. Instead, he signed the statement saying that no one had falsified any statements. He only filed this suit after he met Adam Waldman, the same Adam Waldman who convinced him to file suit against his former business manager, to file suit against his law firm, and fire them, and blame them for things. But by the time that Amber wrote the op-ed, Mr. Depp already had had another opportunity to tell his story. He filed a case in the UK against the son for calling him a wife beater. And in that case, he had many of the same witnesses. He was on the stand for parts of five days. And he got to tell the fact finder in the UK whatever he wanted. Now, it's not the same testimony he told here, because you heard me impeach him about 13 times with his testimony from the UK. But he's had his chances. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to tell Mr. Depp that this was his last chance. Tell him to move on with his life. Tell him to let Amber move on with hers. Stand up for the freedom of speech. Stand up for the First Amendment. This trial is about so much more than Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. It's about the freedom of speech. Stand up for it, protect it, and reject Mr. Depp's claims against Amber. And now you'll hear from Ms. Beretta Hoft uh, about the counterclaim. Thank you. I get, I, I get to say good afternoon. <laughs> and I know you've been listening to everybody for a long time here, and I echo Ben's uh, very, uh, very uh, strong thank you to all of you for this extreme service and extraordinary service. We really appreciate it. I'm going to go really fast um, and try to go as quick as I can so that you can get a break from us and go make your decision. I know you're probably itching to do it at this point. But this is very important to us, and we appreciate your listening, and we appreciate your being here. I'm going to stay on this slide for a moment, and there's something that's very important on this slide that hasn't been brought to your attention by Mr. Depp's team. When you see the actual damages, go down to the last paragraph, if you will. It says, Mr. Depp cannot recover damages for any harm that occurred after November 2, 2020. Do you all see that? So what Mr. Depp's team got up here and told you through Mr. Chu this morning has nothing to do with this case. He had his chance in the UK. He, the, the lawsuit was filed June 2018, six months before the op-ed. The trial was July 2020. The process ended, according to Mr. Marks, their expert, on November 2, 2020. And his damages stopped then. He, he can't get reputational damages. He can't get his legacy back for his children. He can't get anything after that day from you. You can't restore his reputation. You can't give him anything. They didn't tell you that, but the court told you that. And that's a very, very important thing here. He told his story. He had his opportunities. He had his full opportunities to do all of that. And he came in here and lied to you and said he's here to get his reputation back. It's just one of many lies in this case, but it's a really big one. Because here we are, six weeks of your time, precious time, six weeks of this court's time, for what? For nothing only to go after Amber. That's psychological abuse. He's going after Amber for nothing because he wants to put her through this again, the third time. So we're fighting back, and that's the common plan. She finally has said, enough, enough. 
And we're asking you to finally hold this man responsible. He has never accepted responsibility for anything in his life. You've heard it this whole time. He hasn't admitted to anything. He's blamed everybody in the world, his agent, his manager, his lawyer, Amber, his friends, everybody. But he's never accepted responsibility for a thing he's done in his life. But we're asking you to accept, to, to make him accept responsibility, to hold him legally responsible for his actions and to fully and fairly compensate Amber for what he has done by creating this concept of a hoax for the defamation that he has committed that you have heard so much about that just took wildfire and went off into negative media and has made Amber's life pure hell up to this day. We're asking you to do that, to compensate her, to, to be fair and hold him responsible so he stops. We don't want another lawsuit. We don't want anything else. We want to leave Amber alone and let her get on with her life and raise her child. So let's talk about the counterclaim for a moment. These are Adam Waldman statements. You've heard Mr. Depp say, well, why, are you, why aren't you suing Mr. Waldman? <laughs> that, isn't that typical of Mr. Depp? He doesn't take responsibility for anything, so not, now he's going to blame his lawyer. But the evidence is very clear on all three statements, and we'll show them to you in a minute, that he says Adam Waldman, Mr. Depp's attorney, says these things. Now, Mr. Depp says, oh, I didn't even know about those until the counterclaim. Well, we know that's not true because Mr. Waldman's testimony was two months before those statements were made. In February of 2020, Mr. Depp accompanied Mr. Waldman to the Daily Mail, the same place that all three of these statements were published, and he gave them two spliced audio tapes to try to make it look like Amber was the person who was committing the abuse. He went with him. He knew that Mr. Waldman was doing this. He knew that Mr. Waldman was launching a campaign against Amber to try to discredit her. And the timing of this, we're talking, the statements now are April and June of 2020. The trial is July of 2020. So they're launching an attack to try to discredit Amber before the trial in the UK. That's what happened here. And that is Mr. Waldman, but it's Mr. Depp. The judge gave you three different instructions and you'll all have them. He's acting as his attorney. He has the authority. So Mr. Depp is standing in the shoes of Mr. Waldman. Mr. Waldman is standing in the shoes of Mr. Depp. Michelle, can you please bring up the first statement? <coughs> says, Amber and her friends in the media use fake sexual violence allegations as both a sword and shield, depending on their needs. They have selected some of her sexual violence hoax facts as the sword, inflicting them on the public and Mr. Depp. Now, what this statement is meant to imply <coughs> is that Amber is lying about the sexual assaults and using them with the media to try to discredit Mr. Depp. That's the clear implications of this. Now, the, the first part of this is this contradicts Mr. Depp's claims today that the first time you ever heard about the sexual assaults that happened was in this case. It was in the UK case. This is the case that Mr. Depp brought in the UK. And instead of Amber Heard trying to put this out in the media, she did exactly the opposite. Now, this article's not in your evidence, but at least some of you will remember it being shown at one point with the title that said that Amber was successful in being able to treat her allegations of the sexual violence confidential in that proceeding, and it was treated confidential. She did exactly the opposite. She didn't want to tell people this, and you know that. You watched her on the stand. It was heart-rendering for her to have to do this, with the cameras, no less. But what else is false about this statement? It's that there was no false statements of sexual violence. Ben went through all four of them, and I will not repeat them all. You heard the testimony, and interestingly enough, you didn't hear any stories that differed from that with Mr. Depp. He didn't get on the stand and say, you know, no, this didn't happen, to at least a couple of them. 
and he can't in Australia, he can't remember anything likely, but if you just look at the pictures of the destruction in that house, I mean, imagine painting those canvases and how long that took and how much hatred and rage you have to have for somebody to do something like that, writing on the walls, tearing up her nightgown and, and wrapping pieces of raw steak and putting it all over the house. Uh, remember that she also testified that he took her clothes and swiped them through all the paint before she left. Um, you know these things happened. Um, with respect to the malice on this one, you know he knows that he did these things. You know that he knows he was out of it for three days. And that's all that we need to prove for malice. But there's a couple of more facts here. But you can find whatever Mr. Waldman's done, and you can find whatever Mr. Depp has done. And both of those are the same for purposes of evaluating the verdict form. They stand in each other's shoes. When you have an agent, and that's what the jury instructions say, you can go with both. What did Mr. Waldman do? There was an article about the sexual violence that he had put from the April one that went into the trial. Amber's testimony, she was sitting near him in the trial. Adam Waldman threw that newspaper down in front of her de defiantly. That's actual malice. Um, and she was quite, quite upset. And you heard her testimony on the stand about that. He was just inflicting it on her. Remember Bruce Whitkin's testimony. This was Johnny Depp's best friend for 40 years until he testified truthfully four years ago uh, about the drugs and alcohol and he stopped talking to him. There was a couple of really important things that Bruce Whitkin said. One of the things he said, he met Adam Waldman once. Adam Waldman said, do you have any dirt on the Mandels? And he said no, and that was it. Then he didn't care. He is an attack dog. All he wants to do is attack and, and put dirt on people. The second, second thing that Whitkin said that I think was pretty instructive was that, that Johnny Depp has deep-seated anger issues that have nothing to do with Amber. He remembered even back when Johnny was married to his sister-in-law, he had extreme jealousy even back then. Uh, and I think that's pretty significant. Remember, Mr. Wickham also was called in a few times to intercede in some of these fights between Johnny and Amber when he, when he would become so angry. The last thing I thought he said that was actually pretty important um, was that Kipper and his whole group are a scam. He said, you know, how is it that they can be sober, sober doctors, you know, for these years, years, and he's never sober. You know, he's even taking pot all the time. How can you be sober? I thought that was quite instructive. But in any event, going back to, that's the first statement. The second statement, Michelle, if you can bring that one up. Oh, before I go there, I want to talk about a few more things for Mr. Waldman that you have in your, in your uh, pocket to be able to find additional malice with him. Remember, he's the one that after the UK trial, went to the LAPD with a notebook full of things and tried to get perjury charges against Amber. The LAPD said, we don't investigate those things. Um, but he then went to a German newspaper and said, Amber is being investigated by the NYPD, or the uh, LAPD, for perjury. Do you remember that? That's malice. That's showing his intent to do harm to Amber. Uh, he also admitted that he speaks to that umbrella guy, and you'll see that one text in there from the person from TMZ. That umbrella guy is the big lead of Johnny Depp's, you know, positive uh, uh, social media that is putting all the negative out on Amber, Amber Heard. Uh, and he also ended up getting knocked out of Twitter because he was abusing Amber. Um, so now we'll go to the second counterclaim statement. And that is quite simply, this was an ambush, a hoax. They set Mr. Depp up by calling the cops, but the first attempts didn't do the trick. The officers came to the penthouses, thoroughly searched and interviewed, and left after seeing no damage to face or property. So Amber and her friends spilled a little wine, roughed the place up, got their story straight under the direction of a lawyer and publicist, then placed a second call to 911. Now this is May 21. Now the clear implication here is that they're saying that Amber got together with her friends. They decided they were gonna set Johnny up to be charged for domestic violence. And so they called the police and they tried to make up this whole story, get him arrested, but the police said there's no evidence here uh, and went away and they said, darn, 
And so they spilled wine and they, you know, busted up the place and they called 911. They got, they got advice from a lawyer and a publicist, called 911 and tried again to get Johnny charged. That's what this, this says. Now we all know that's false and it's heinously false. Uh, because, you know, after these events happened, and Ben talked about a little bit of it, but I'll talk about the rest of it, and I'm going to try to do it really quickly. Um, but, but we all know Amber did everything in her power not to tell them who Johnny was, not to press charges, not to have him arrested. The exact opposite of this. But what were the facts of May 21st? He comes over, he's already been drinking, he's already high, and he is on a tear about feces in the bed from a month ago. And remember how Amber talked about when he gets into these drug-induced things, he gets into these paranoias, and he gets some idea in his head, and he just won't let it go. And that was his this time. There's somebody put that feces in the bed a month ago. That was his spin. So she gets I.O. Tillett on, on the phone. He's in New York at the time. He's going, they thought, this is ridiculous. Of course nobody did. And by the way, Boo has this huge problem. Of course it was Boo. You know, he's always doing this. But Johnny just won't get there. So then they laugh. That makes him mad. Then he throws the phone at Amber. Amber screams out and says, ow, you just threw the cell phone at me. It hurts. I.O. says, Amber, get out of there. Johnny gets madder, pulls her hair, grabs her and starts hitting her. So Io gets hold of Rocky Pennington. She comes over as quickly as she can. She goes and gets in between the two of them. She puts her hands up on his chest. He pushes them down. And then she continues to stand in between them. And he's screaming loudly ten times, Amber, get the fuck up. Amber, get the fuck up. Amber, get the fuck up. Loudly, loudly. Uh, then his, his bodyguards hear this, they come in, they break it up. That's how that happens. But the next part of this, remember Josh Drew, and, and I think Elizabeth Mars was amazing in this one. Remember their testimony? You know, he, for after that he goes and he has to, you know, he always leaves a you know, path of destruction as he's leaving. So he, you know, bashes up things and you saw Ben's pictures here on the picture frames, knocks things over as he's going goes down the hallway, he's splashing the wine, he gets his bodyguards to let him into Penthouse 5. That's where Josh and Elizabeth are trying to help with Rocky's bead thing for the next day. And he comes in storming in and he says, get your bitch out of here. And he's got the big magnum and he's mad. And Elizabeth is just terrified. She barely knows Johnny. She's met him four times and she goes ripping out of there as fast as she can. And Josh gets out of there too. Then what does he do? Uh, he rearranges the furniture, or he might have knocked something off, you know, one of one of the countertops or something. I think is the, is the testimony of his bodyguards. But you saw the pictures. He went through and trashed that place again as he left. Now, the next part of this is the police coming. Io calls the police. He's in New York. He calls the New York police 911. He's afraid they're not going to get there fast enough. He still remembers December 15 because he came in afterwards and saw all of the injuries on Amber and all the evidence. Um, and he's terrified that, that Amber's still in there, the police haven't come, and that Johnny's going to kill her. So he calls a friend in LA and says, please call 911. We got to get somebody there fast. So she calls 911. So we have two calls, and you'll see the call summary. And the call summary shows those two calls r really close in prox proximity here. So it's not them, uh-oh, we didn't get the first police officer, so we'll rough up the place and make a second one. You'll see that they're like eight minutes apart uh, up there. But it took two hours to dispatch the two different ones, and Amber never even had any idea that the second one was coming. The first one's come. And you know, we've talked about it, we've shown you the pictures. The police officers admitted that those pictures could, could very much have been what was there that night. Remember, Doc, Officer Haddon, it was his first week on the job. Officer Science was three, three years on the job at that point. They say, you know, they told Josh that if she will press charges, if she'll give a name, we can file a report and make an arrest. She wouldn't do it. You did hear from Detective Sandanaga. That's the domestic That's violence. <laughs>
You recall Josh Drew saying that the police officer told him, you know, she'll give a name, we'll make an arrest. He definitely said that. Um, but in any event, uh, uh, she would not... She would not cooperate. She didn't want to. But, but Detective Sandanaga, their domestic relations or domestic violence uh, person, said they should have done an incident report no matter what, even if they decided there wasn't a crime. Because domestic violence it has the cycles, they come back. And it's good to have the record for the next time that it might happen. So she said they should have under the circumstances, even if they didn't. And she also said that when they put verbal dispute only in those calls, it is a code that they use, and you'll see that it's twice on that call report, so they, to, to say that's why we didn't write a report. Um, but in any event, whether the police officers you know, forgot about it two months later when they were first asked about it, whether they just decided she's never going to press charges, and you'll see on the call report they're insisting that to the second set, it doesn't make any difference. The point is, this is still false. This statement is still false, because Amber did everything but try to press charges against Johnny Depp. So they go away, uh, and the testimony is that Josh and Amber and Rocky cleaned up because they have dogs, so they cleaned up a lot of the glass and the wine and, and those types. They had no idea the second police officers were coming by, and they certainly didn't call them, and they certainly didn't talk, they never talked to a publicist. She did talk to a lawyer who gave her advice, and that's why she wouldn't tell them you know, anything. She said, I'm not going to cooperate at all. Um, so the second one's coming. You saw that. You've got the video cameras in there. You see, there's no effort by them to try to get now these officers to press charges against Johnny Depp. Just the opposite. Josh Drew doesn't want to even let him in the place. Uh, they come through quickly. Everything's fine. They wave. Everything's fine. Are they trying to press charges against Johnny? No. They're not trying to do anything. They're trying to get him out of there, which makes this statement 100% false. Was it made with malice? Absolutely. There's nobody that thinks that Amber tried to press charges that night. Johnny knew that. But the other thing that's very helpful and what you should look at is Defendant's Exhibits 772 and 773. Because once again, the next day, Johnny apologizes to Amber. He says in two different text messages, that 772 and 773, um, he says, my profound apologies in one of them, and my apologies are eternal in the other one. What is he apologizing for the next day on May 22nd if he didn't know that he did all of those things? And by the way, remember Isaac Baruch even remembers the wine in the hallway. The police, none of the police officers remember the wine. And that's because they're busy and they got a zillion other things going and they didn't remember this call two months later when they were asked about it. Um, so that's, that's the next one. Um, so clearly, that's 100% false. Clearly, they knew it. Clearly, there's malice in making that statement. They're trying to suggest that she's manufacturing evidence with her friends to try to frame Mr. Depp. Nothing could be further from the truth on that one. And there's not, she did not want those police officers to press charges. Now, let's go to the third one. Oh, and let's talk about the makeup just for a moment while we're going to the third one. This makeup thing, fresh-faced, natural. These were Adam Waldman planting these when he, when he talked to the ECB people. You know, remember the testimony here. We kept asking, so did you talk to Mr. Waldman? Did you talk to Mr. Waldman? Mr. Waldman was trying to plant in all of these people's Objection, homes. Your Honor. But somehow, she wasn't. Did he approach? So I didn't say that any of the witnesses admitted that Adam Walton planted that. I'm saying he planted it. That's me arguing the planting. And that's because it's all the same thing. She wasn't wearing any makeup. She was natural. She wasn't wearing a stitch of makeup. Every one of them says it. It's the exact same thing. Well, why would you say that? She's an actor. She's not going to go outside her house, you know, without putting makeup on. And if she has bruises, why on earth? 
when she's been covering them up for four years, why on earth would she not put makeup on so that she would cover those up? Why on earth would she not want to cover up those bruises? It makes no sense. But you know what? You guys saw her here. You guys saw it. Um, you saw Amber on the stand. There were days where she didn't wear eye makeup. A lot of people think that she's not wearing makeup when she doesn't have mascara and, and eyeliner on. She has different looks, and some of them are with eye makeup, and some of them are without. And people misunderstand, especially people that aren't that good at makeup, and a lot of men, frankly, um, go, oh, that's, then she probably doesn't have makeup. And that's where that mistake happens. But you heard her testimony, and you heard her makeup artist te testimony saying she doesn't go out of her room without concealer and foundation. She knows how to put these things in. And you saw Defendant's Exhibit 155, and you'll have the actual thing in there. That's the type of palette she used. And she was very adept at telling you what color she puts on for the different days of bruises. This is a woman who, for four years, did everything she could to cover up anybody knowing anything about this abuse. Do you honestly think she's just going to walk around for the week with her bruises exposed? Of course she's not. Now, let's go to the third one. And this is the abuse hoax. He says, we've reached the beginning of the end of Ms. Hurd's abuse hoax against Johnny Depp. Now, the, 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 obviously the defamatory meaning of that is that Amber's creating an abuse hoax. But there is no abuse hoax. I don't need to tell you all of the evidence because Ben did a beautiful job of just taking you through all of those different things. But I will point out a couple things for you. And that is, remember Bonnie Jacobs, the therapist. Dr. Hughes and Dr. Spiegel testified about Bonnie Jacobs' notes. And remember that I was holding that, you don't get to see them, but they testified that they went through them. Dr. Hughes testified that she also spoke with Bonnie Jacobs. She kept contemporaneous notes from 2011 when she first started seeing Amber. And the abuse is documented in those notes, is what Dr. Hughes testified to. They start in 2012, both physical and Ob Objection, your honor. That doctor to So Dr. Hughes specifically characterized Dr. Jacob, Dr. Jabani Jacobs' notes as reflecting both contemporaneous physical abuse and sexual abuse throughout that time period. Dr. Spiegel confirmed that later and said the same. When I asked Dr. Curry if she had reviewed those notes, she said yes, but she had no comment. And she Your did Honor, objection. That, that was in there. Thank you. 
confirmed that he had reviewed Bonnie Jacobs' notes as well. And when I asked Dr. Curry, she said she had reviewed them, but she had no comment, but she also didn't deny that those were in there. Amber Heard testified that she went back, and because of Bonnie Jacobs' notes, she realized for the first time that the abuse started much earlier than she even realized before. She always had thought that it, it, it had started in 2013. When she went back and saw Bonnie Jacobs' notes, she realized that it had started much earlier, and she was very embarrassed by that. Now, significantly, you remember that she testified about how she went, she was first called upon to actually detail all of her events of abuse in February of this year. And she went through and took the notes, took photos, took, you know, she took everything she had, calendars, everything, put it all together, and you heard about at least 64 pages of detailed accountability of that. And Mr. Depp's team has been able to not refute any of that. I remember they tried to impeach her and say, well, you didn't say that. She said, yes, I did, on page 64. Remember that? It was a very, very difficult process for her because there was an awful lot of it. And she put it in great detail. Now, let's talk for a moment about the motive. Uh, they have said that she has created this whole hoax, and I think Ben's done a nice job of showing how that can't possibly have been. But what would Amber Heard's motive be for creating the hoax, or creating any of this, or making any of this up? That's a big question here. They call her a gold digger, right? But she, she obviously couldn't have done it for the money, because first of all, remember the testimony of Laura Wasser, the divorce attorney. She said that California is a no-fault state and community property. So Amber doesn't have to have an abuse. She, she, could have, she could have divorced him for irreconcilable differences, for abandonment, for adultery, for anything. She doesn't need an excuse. And she gets 50% of whatever he earns during the time of the marriage, unless they had a prenup or a postnup. The testimony from Michelle Mulrooney was that Amber completely cooperated with the prenup and the postnup, but it was Johnny Depp who, and you've already heard from Ben, he called her up and fired her. He didn't want a postnup or a prenup. So she's entitled to 50% of everything he, he, owned, he uh, earns during that time. Now we have Plaintiff's Exhibit 936 in evidence. And look at page 69. It says how much he made in 2015. It was 43 million. Remember Dr. Mr. Spindler, Depp's expert, who said that he made 22 million in 2016. So you got 65 million dollars. Amber was entitled to 31.5 at least. That doesn't include all the back ends from, for example, Pirates 5. She was entitled to that money. So she didn't need to say anything. She could have just said, I don't like you anymore. I don't like the color of your hair. I'm going to divorce you. Your she Honor, we're going to object again.
So if you do the math, Amber is entitled to at least 31.5. What does she take? Seven million. What does she do with the seven million? She gives it to charity, or she intends to give it to charity. Now they make much ado about the pledge versus donation, but both the corporate designees for ACLU and for Children's Hospital said donation and pledge are interchangeable. You know, these are pledges. The ACLU corporate designee said, you typically do pledges because of the tax benefits, and that's what she said. She pledged it over a period of time because of the tax implications to it and because she was getting paid over the time. Now she started to make these donations and you'll see that the first one was on behalf of Mr. Depp's uh, business manager, Mr. White, actually sent the letters with the 100,000 for each of those. That was the initial ones. Um, he was trying to take credit for those and in fact, both the ACLU and Children's Hospital got confused and gave the credit to Mr. Depp, not to Amber for those. Then she made payments to both and Elon Musk also made payments to both for 500,000 each, which she didn't count to her pledge, but they helped those organizations. At the end of the day, she's made a million dollars in pledge in payments to them, but then she got sued here and hasn't been able to because she spent six million dollars in attorney's fees. That is unrefuted. She still intends to pay those pledges, honor those pledges, and she said that throughout, and I elicited from both the ACLU and from Children's Hospital, they haven't expired, she can pay them whenever she wants to, and she fully intends to, but she has to get out from under this first. Now, who would, accuse, who would blame a woman for giving a million dollars in, in charitable donations? Who would do that? That sounds like psychological abuse to me. Now, Mr. Mandel testified that Johnny Depp is not a charitable person, and he hasn't written any big checks for him. Mr. Depp got on the stand and says he does it unanimously, uh, uh, anonymously, but Mr. Mandel would have been the one writing the checks, and he says that didn't happen. Um, now let's go to damages because I promised you I was going to go pretty fast here. Um, there's a few different types of damages, but one of the things that the court has talked to you about, she, she, she told you that because we have defamation, it's invidious, and therefore it's very difficult to prove these. And so these damages to business reputation, inconvenience, embarrassment are presumed. You don't have to prove those damages. And one great example of that is the testimony from Mr. Hamada at Warner Brothers. He didn't want to have to get in the middle of all of this with Aquaman 2. They haven't even released it. So he didn't read anything in preparation for his deposition. He didn't talk to anybody before his deposition. He said that he, he tried to do technicals and say, no, we never terminated her contract. But oh yeah, we did tell her we were probably not going to renew her option. Um, and then we didn't change the script, but Amber got the script, and yes, they did change it. Then he said, um, you know, no, we never negotiate salaries, but oh yeah, we did negotiate, renegotiate Jason Momoa's and Gal Gadot's. So he just doesn't want to admit to any of these things. But what came out in Hamada's deposition, and I hope you were listening carefully to this, was the email from James Wan, the director, and, Jane, and uh, Jason Momoa, her co-star, who said they guarantee if they are in the film, she is going to be Mira in the film. Why would they do that unless they thought Warner Brothers was being unfair to her? And why did she get almost knocked out of it? Because of the defamatory statements. When they came out, they took on a life of their own. Ron Schnell, the, the uh, young Sheldon, I call him the Doogie Hauser, uh, our, our expert on IT, took you through and tracked how they tracked the defamatory statements, the language from the defamatory statements, how that went through the social media and the negative social media. Uh, and it kept going and kept going. And he tracked all the way until a few months ago over 2.36 million negative tweets, negative Instagrams, negative social media's comments about Amber that relate specifically to the, in, the information that was in those three defamatory statements. It took on a life of its own. They started to get Amber fired from Aquaman 2. They have continued to this day. They have followed her everywhere. Everybody has stopped wanting her. L'Oreal won't use her, even though they've kept her on from that time. She lost three different opportunities that were being discussed with her. The most significant part of that, though, is that Aquaman was the biggest blockbuster ever for DC Films. It was the biggest. It was over a billion dollars. This was her opportunity for her star. 
Even the experts from Mr. Depp admitted this was her blockbuster, this was her mega. But what happened instead, as she's going through, as it's coming out, and in that 16 months they were going, well, nothing happened. Yeah, lots happened. She was had three different films she was discussing. She, had, she got the L'Oreal contract. She, she got the stand. All of those things were happening because of Aquaman. And then everything shut down. She wasn't allowed to do publicity for the stand. She wasn't allowed to, uh, she, she you know, hasn't been allowed to do anything for L'Oreal. She got shut down from her charitable organizations. She, she ended up not getting the Amazon movie. And then they gave her a hard time about Aquaman 2. And instead of the career trajectory of the other comparators, who all went way up, and by the way, all the experts admit that that career tra trajectory went well for all the rest of them, and she's the only one that didn't have it. And the reason is because of the defamatory statements. So you have some very good information to help you on, on ascertaining those damages. Now, Jessica Kovacevic, um, and I don't know if you remember her, but she was her agent. She said, everybody just stopped talking. The producers don't want her, the directors don't want her, nobody wants her. We just can't get the traction, and we should have been able to get the traction, and they say it's because of those statements. So Catherine Arnold uh, gave you uh, some good estimates on this, and she gave you a very good basis for it. And she didn't use Jason Momoa's or Gal Gadot's or the others. She used Amber's, but used those comparators to show that they got big movies, that they got commercial opportunities, that they got these TV opportunities, but she used the base that Amber had. So she used the four million from the Aquaman that would be three. She used the, the stands, you know, how much they got paid per movie. And what she estimated on those, and she went through those details, is that if you took that for the last two years and projected into the next three to four, that it's between 47 and 50 million dollars that she could have had instead of her star being completely extinguished. And that's what's happened to her. The emotional distress damages are even more extreme here. Um, and that is, Don Hughes testified extensively about the PTSD and what she goes through. And every time she's called a liar, every time these hoax things come up, everything, it causes her to relive all of it. She talks about the panic attacks, the nervousness, the intrusive thoughts, the nightmares, all of the, the, the sweats, the, you know, the anxiety that goes through all of this. Uh, it's, it's significant, but probably the most compelling testimony that you could ever hear was from Amber yesterday and, and when she took the stand before. It has destroyed her life. This has consumed her. She's getting death threats. Her daughter, they're threatening to put her daughter in a microwave, for God's sakes. She can't get away from this. It's everywhere. This media, the social media that has just taken off, has just consumed her life. As she said, I'm a human being. No human being should be put through this. Now, Johnny Depp sued for a hundred million or for fifty million dollars, and we sent a message back saying, "Fine, then we're going to sue for a hundred million because look at what you've done to her." We're not we're not asking you to give a hundred million dollars. We're asking you to just look at the damages in this case and just be fair and reasonable in whatever you determine by following the evidence and the instructions. But we do ask that you fully and fairly compensate. Amber for everything that she's been through, both in terms of reputation and emotional distress. The very last point is punitive damages, and you surely have those in this case. We've asked for 350000 for the punitive damages, and we would ask that you award that. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do, um, we still have rebuttal closing arguments. But I can guarantee you that the rebuttal closing arguments will be done combined within 45 minutes. But what I want to do is go ahead and uh, let you have your lunch. Um, and then after lunch, we'll come back in the courtroom, have the rebuttal closing arguments, and then we'll submit the case to you. Okay? All right. So go ahead and have your lunch. Uh, do not discuss the case with each other and do not do any outside research. Okay? So let's let's come back at 2:10, um, and just for the record, uh, plaintiffs have 39 minutes left for rebuttal. Defendants have six minutes. Okay.
you, I didn't take any time off from the sidebars, zero off from the sidebars. It's all from 